Good morning. Yeah, and happy Father's Day to all the dads in here. So, uh, dads, let me ask you, did you enjoy breakfast in bed this morning? I, I mean, if it wasn't, that, if it didn't happen, I'm sure they plan on serving you lunch in bed. So, so it gives you something to look forward to, right? So, yeah, happy Father's Day. I thought you'd enjoy that little video uh, that you just saw of phrases that uh, are foreign to our lips as dads. We just don't say stuff like that. We are ready today for our third message in our series. This actually marks um, the midway point, a five-part series, and this is message number three. And I want to kind of start the ball rolling by just making an observation. This is a personal perspective observation. Our world is shrinking. Okay? Now, I, I'm not referencing the diameter of the earth. I mean, I think that's remained pretty constant for quite a long time. It's 7,900 and whatever, 20 miles or so. Um, so I don't know why it's literally the earth itself is shrinking, but uh, um, in so many different ways, our perception of the world, at least for me, is getting smaller and smaller. For the first 17 years of my life, when I was growing up and I was living at home, uh, we just never left the state of Kansas. And uh, it wasn't that far, we weren't that far away from other states, because I grew up in Northeast Kansas most of those years, uh, just on the other side of Topeka, uh, first couple of years up in Nemahal County, if you know where that is, way up in the northern edge. And, and uh, But uh, my family just never traveled. And in fact, uh, I think maybe I left the state of Kansas three times. All those years I was growing up twice. It was in Kansas City, Missouri. We went and saw an aunt and an uncle. And uh, so that w those constituted times that we left the state of Kansas. And the other time we were visiting a relative up in the northern part of Nemahaw County, and uh, um, Dad just decided when it was time to go home that we went north two miles and turned around, and then he said, okay, now you kids can tell everyone you've been to Nebraska. You know, and that, that was it. So uh, we, just, we just never traveled. Never, I mean, we really only ever had one and a half vacations, and those were Council Grove, and I'll explain a different time why I say a half, because that one didn't turn out so well. But, uh, um, but yeah, it's, it's just when I was a kid, the world seemed so big. Um, there, there was just, and because I, I wasn't seeing it. It wasn't until I was close to 30 years old that I took my first uh, flight in a plane. And uh, Colette and I together, we rode in, uh, Bernie McPherson was his name, a farmer in Illinois that uh, had a single engine plane and a grass landing strip out behind his farmhouse. And that, that was our first flight. We were both right around 30 years of age. And uh, boy, that was big news for us. We'd never done something like that before. And it wasn't until after I was 35 years old, it was probably about 36 or so, that I actually got into a big plane and uh, flew to Atlanta, Georgia. And that, that was really the first big um, trip like, like that that, uh, that I ever had. Um, nowadays, things have sped up. Things have changed. And, and this is why I say it seems like the world is shrinking um, I reported to you last August that uh, I've now officially hit all 48 states, continental states, on my motorcycle, starting from here in Shawnee. So, so you know, the United States doesn't seem as big as what it used to seem, because I've been to every state here, at least, not Alaska yet. That would be a bucket list item, but... Uh, but uh, so it seems like the earth, the earth around me, you know, is getting smaller. In fact, uh, 
um, Colette and I have had the opportunity to leave the country a few times. We've been to Jamaica. We've been to Haiti. Um, we've gone and seen Harvey and Nancy Backus in Jordan. I've uh, been there a couple of times. One of the trips, we decided uh, while we're all the way over here, let's go to Egypt. So we went to Egypt for about six days or, or so and, and had that opportunity. A couple years ago, uh, we went to Normandy and saw some of the sites there, rented a car, drove across France, and, and ended up going through Switzerland and, and all of that into Germany. And, and, and so the world around just seems to be getting smaller because little by little, you know, after I hit age 35, it seems like that's when things started accelerating. You know, I started getting out and about and traveling a little bit more. And you add to that um, the expanding exposure through television, right, and the Internet. And don't underestimate the impact of that. And a lot of you know firsthand what I'm talking about because when I was growing up, you know, in our home, we had the rabbit ears, rabbit ear antennas like so many of you probably had and so we had a grand total of what three channels you know and that was it and what kind of cultural exposure were we getting to the world from the shows we were watching Gunsmoke <laughs> Petticoat Junction <laughs> remember remember some of those shows you know I, I mean so, so, some of the, the the partridge family the Waltons and Hee Haw, yeah, how could I forget that one? Hee Haw, Lawrence Welk, and, you know, and these were the kind of shows that were on TV. And so there wasn't a huge amount of cultural exposure that was coming from some of that. Now, there was one particular show that I tried to watch uh, most weeks uh, that really did give me some exposure, and that was Wild Kingdom. You know, I did enjoy that. I saw some things that, that uh, you know, I, I wasn't able to see. Um, in, in my life. But, boy, that has changed. I mean, don't have three channels anymore. If you've got cable or if you've got a dish or something, you probably got 100 channels or 150, maybe more channels. You've got all these different things that you can be watching. You've got Internet. You could Google whatever it is you want to Google and see images and read about all these different things, other people telling their stories and their experiences. And, and, and you got a, if you've got a smartphone, you, know, you probably get little news flashes on there, something that can happen 1,500 miles away from here or 3,000 miles away from here. It can happen and in a matter just a few minutes, you're getting a news update of what it is that just happened. Boy, our world has changed a lot. And that's why I say that in a lot of ways, it seems like our world is shrinking. But here's the funny thing about that. Though we're getting more informed than what we used to be, it kind of has a way of adding to the confusion of how we see the world around us. Especially in regards to like what we're talking about in this series of messages, we're talking about aren't all religions basically the same? And you start talking about various religions that exist in the world. And the more that you learn, the more confusing sometimes all of this can be. You see, initially at one particular point in time, a lot of us in this room the era that we grew up in, it was fairly simple. It was fairly basic. You know, you had Christianity. Maybe you had, a, you know, this flavor as opposed to this flavor. Maybe it was Roman Catholic, you know, which is what I grew up with. Or, or maybe it was Methodist or Presbyterian or Baptist. But, but still, at the very core of it, it is Jesus Christ. And what he did and his teachings. And so, so in our minds, it was fairly basic. You had one way, and then somewhere along the way, you got introduced to Jehovah Witnesses. 
or Mormons. And all of a sudden, it's just like, okay, this isn't as black and white as what I thought it was. Because there's one way, but maybe there's another way. And so a little bit of confusion started into play. And then as you continue to be exposed to additional religions, whether they be things that have started here in the United States or they are things over in the Middle East that got started over there, then all of a sudden now it's kind of becoming a tangled confusion. And it's like now, is there one way? I'm having a harder time making heads or tails out of this. How does this religion fit with this religion? And which religion is the right religion? And as you get exposed to more and more, all of a sudden you realize it's not just a matter of six different religions or a dozen religions or 18 religions. It's like everywhere you turn, it's like there's religions. And you discover that there are the number of religions in the world numbers in the hundreds, even thousands. And the more you see that, the more confusing it can become. And so the notion starts to get kind of a following, starts to get footing. People kind of promote the idea that these religions aren't really that different. They're more alike than they are different than one another. And you hear that and you, you kind of think, maybe that's true. And some of your peers, some of the things that they say and, and some of the postings that they do on their Facebook or on their bumper sticker or whatever the case might be seems to send a message that all of these different religions, regardless of where it had its origin, they all lead to the same place. And so whether you're following Christianity or you're following Islam or um, Hinduism or Taoism or Mormonism or whatever, they all eventually end up in the same place. Some of them maybe takes a little longer to get there, but yet all the same. And that's kind of what our peers sometimes seem to drive home with us. Well, that's why we're doing this series of messages, to examine those kinds of claims closer. And what we're seeing, now that we're at the midway point in the series, what we're seeing is that it doesn't work that way. They're not all going to the same place. They're not all more alike than they are different than one another. As a matter of fact, it can't work that way. And I've touched on some of this already in the series, but let me just sprinkle in a few more thoughts at this particular point in time to illustrate the point. Mormonism, for example, teaches that there are many gods in existence and that you yourself can become a god if you're a man. You can become a god. Christianity, as opposed to that, teaches that there's only one God and you can never become a God. See how those clash with one another? Islam, the second largest world religion, teaches that Jesus is not God in the flesh. He is just a man, a prophet of a man but just a man all the same. Christianity teaches that Jesus is much more than just a man. That Jesus is God in the flesh. Jesus can't be both God and not God at the same time. I mean, how would that work? Hinduism teaches that we are reincarnated over and over and over again. This isn't your... Your first rodeo, you've been through all of this before. And probably, perhaps, as a human being, who knows what corner of the earth you were in in a previous life, but there's a chance that you were an animal or maybe even an insect. But that's Hinduism. It's a cycle that just keeps going over and over and over. Christianity teaches that this life is it. You live once, 
one life, and this is the life. Others teach that, that, like Buddhism, for example, that everything you see is an illusion. Everything you see around you is an illusion. Whatever it is that you climbed into, the car or truck, in order to get here today, that really doesn't exist. It's an illusion. You think it's real, but it's really not real. So Buddhism teaches that everything is an illusion, it doesn't exist, and hopefully one day you'll be able to fully come to that understanding in its fullness. Christianity teaches that it's the Lord that created all things and sustains all things for our enjoyment. There really is a physical universe. So you see, you start looking at all of this and, and, and you've got to say somewhere along the line, they all cannot be true. It's just not possible. They can't be true. It'd be like you and, and, and me standing right alongside the edge of a very busy street. And uh, at that particular moment in time, we're both wanting to cross the street and uh, so we're standing there side by side, and I see a, a big bus that's barreling down, moving at a pretty good rate, and it's surrounded by several cars and a couple of pickups, and then it's coming along. And so I make the comment that now's not a good time right now, not with all of that. Let's just hold off. But no sooner do I punctuate that sentence with a period, and you say, oh, now is the perfect time. Come on, take my hand. Let's go across the street right now. Both of us can't be correct. Because, because truth, it, it doesn't contradict truth. It doesn't contradict itself. If God exists, then God is... God has not instituted mutually exclusive and contradictory belief systems in an attempt to bring people to himself. That's not who God is. God is not the author of confusion. Yeah, there are certain similarities between some of these religions. There are some similarities. You know, most of them do have some form of prayer, or meditation, um, assembling together, um, worship of some type, uh, the promotion and teaching of a moral code, a belief system. Most of them share some of that kind of stuff in common, but yet the differences are so striking that they're not. They're not all similar versions of the same thing. And so today what we're going to do is we're going to look specifically at four very distinct differences that set Christianity apart from all other religions in the world. Okay? Four specific things. These aren't peripheral things. These are core things. These are critical differences. Good things to be aware of and good stuff to know so that when you find yourself in a conversation with someone, a co-worker or a relative, you know, about this very subject, then that'll happen sooner or later. You'll have a little material in which to be able to talk about, to kind of steer the discussion. So what are these four distinct differences that sets Christianity apart from all other religions? Number one. Christianity involves God reaching out to us. Now we look at that and there's nothing earth shattering about that for most of us that are here today. We look at that and it's just like, well, duh. I mean, what's the big deal about that? God reaching out to us. Well, see, that's because of our orientation growing up in this country and, and with... Uh, um, a larger percentage of people having been exposed to Christianity in one form or another. But the thing is that other religions, by and large, involve just the opposite. People attempting to get God's attention. People attempting to reach out to God, to appease God. 
Meanwhile, God seems to be somewhat distant and even indifferent to, to what people are attempting to do. But with Christianity, this, is, this has been our understanding from the get-go. From the very beginning, God has been pursuing mankind. God has been seeking fellowship with his creation that has been made in his image. We see it all the way back in the first book of the Bible in Genesis chapter 3, verses 8 and 9. It says this, Then the man and his wife, which is Adam and Eve, heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze. And they hid themselves from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. So the Lord God called out to the man and said to him, Where are you? Now God's all-knowing, you know, so it's not like God really didn't know where they were. But there is a dynamic that is happening here. This is actually recorded in chapter 3, right on the heels of when Adam and Eve disobeyed God. And so their relationship with God was shattered because sin has now been introduced to the human race. And because of the shame that Adam and Eve feel because of their, their sin, they're hiding from God. But, but the way the verse reads is that it, it's almost like this has been a pattern of God's to be walking in the garden in the evening and to be fellowshipping with his creation, with Adam and Eve. But on this occasion, Adam and Eve are trying to avoid him. And so he's like, where are you guys? What's going on here? But, but the message that, that is embedded inside of this is that, that God is pursuing mankind. God wants to be close to man, And from this point moving forward, God is on a mission of reconciliation with mankind, his creation. And that's what the rest of the Bible records for us. And there's all kinds of examples and creative examples of God doing just that, reaching out to us. You have things like a burning bush. That isn't being consumed by the flame. But God sends a message to a fellow named Moses in saying, go back to Egypt and tell Pharaoh to let my people go. I want my people to come to me. And God reaching out and he's doing it through a burning bush and, and sending a fellow by the name of Moses to deliver the message to others. You have, you turn every couple of pages in your Bible and you start reading, especially in the Old Testament era, you start reading about another prophet in the Bible. And what were all these prophets all about? These prophets were delivering a message. God was calling out for people to turn, to turn from their sin and to turn back to him. And that's really what the word prophet means. It means to speak forth. To speak forth on God's behalf. And that's what all these prophets were doing. God reaching out him. Sending messengers. Trying to bring people back to him. And you get to the New Testament. And, and, and right at the very beginning of the New Testament. We read this in John chapter 1 verse 14. It says, so the word became human and made his home among us. That's talking about Jesus. And Jesus taking on human flesh. And dwelling among us. This is how much God has been reaching out to us is that he would go to this extent is he would temporarily set aside his glory in heaven and this is described more in Philippians chapter 2 where he would temporarily set aside his glory and clothe himself with human flesh and come to us. All a part of reaching out to us. And what was his mission in doing that? What was the purpose behind that? Well, in Jesus' own words, he explained it this way. In Luke 19, verse 10, the Son of Man came to find lost people and save them. You see, he's reaching out to us. It's the whole reason that he came into this world. 
And then we start reading about passages of Scripture that talk about the indwelling Holy Spirit. How back in the old era that uh, God's presence was represented by a flame of fire. Remember when they came out of Egypt? A flame of fire at night and a cloud of smoke, a pillar of smoke during the day. But then later they built a tabernacle. And Ben talked about this a couple of Sundays ago and how God's presence dwelt in the tabernacle. And then eventually there was the permanent form of the tabernacle and that was called the temple and that was located in Jerusalem and that is where God's presence dwelt in the Holy of Holies. But as we continue to read in Scripture, because of Jesus and what Jesus accomplished when he came into the world, now God's temple doesn't involve brick and mortar. It doesn't involve a building. It's God comes and dwells through his Spirit within his people, the indwelling Holy Spirit. Our bodies are now the temple of the Holy Spirit. But you see, it's just one more step illustrating the whole point that God is reaching out to us. God is so much into the details. So much into the details of your life and my life. I like the way that Paul described it when he was talking to the people at Athens. In Acts chapter 17, he said it like this. From one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. Now, you look at the last couple of lines in that passage, and it makes it sound like we're the ones that are reaching out to him. Well, don't skip over the first four or five lines there, because the first four or five lines set up those last couple of lines. It basically is saying that God has established both the time and the place of where you live so that you will be better able to reach out to him. You see, it's all been about God taking the initiative. From the very beginning. It's not just an accident that you live where you live. And that you've been exposed to Christian teaching. And maybe an individual that reached out to you and your family. And first shared the gospel message. That stuff wasn't all an accident. That was all part of God's plan. As he's been reaching out for you. See this is part of what sets Christianity. Apart from all other religions. And to carry it a step further, number two, how is Christianity different from the others? Christianity focuses on a relationship. It's all about a relationship. You see, other religions are founded upon teachings. Christianity is based on a person. Other religions are preoccupied with rituals. Christianity spotlights a relationship. This is what sets Christianity apart. You might be interested to know that in the Quran, which is the Bible for Islam, the second largest religion in the world, in, in the Quran, there isn't a single mention of the love of Allah, which is the word they use for God, there is not a single mention of the love of Allah for the world or for people. That's not mentioned one single time in their holy book. Oh, there's many laws. There's many rules. And there are strict warnings of penalties if you violate those rules for not, for not keeping the laws. But a relationship with Allah is a totally foreign concept in Islam. That's not something they teach or talk about. It's not necessarily even something they believe in. But yet we look in Christianity and we look at the word and we see it. And we see it all over the place. It's about a relationship. And we read passages like what Jesus said in John chapter 15. In this chapter, he talks about how he's the vine and we are the branches and how critically important it is that we abide in him. We need to remain in him. And so with that start of the teaching, 
In John 15, he goes on and says this in verse 15. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I've called you friends. For everything that I've learned from my father, I've made known to you. Jesus calling us friends. That's a relationship term. <laughs> you know that. You recognize that for what it is. But there it is right there. Coming from the one who temporarily set aside his glory in heaven and clothed himself with human flesh and came into this world to do something totally incredible on our behalf. What with the crucifixion and all of that kind of stuff. And here he is. He's calling us his friends. See, Christianity is not simply about following a set of teachings and rules. It's about following a man whose name is Jesus. Someone who is much more than a man. And this sets Christianity apart from other religions. A third thing that, that is a real clear distinction is that Christianity is built on the resurrection of Jesus. I mean, you kind of would have known that this was going to come into play somewhere in what we were talking about here today because this is monumental in importance. When you stop and you think about Buddhism and the originator of Buddhism, the guy who became known as Buddha, or you think about Islam and the guy that started that, Muhammad, or you think about Mormonism and the guy that started that, Joseph Smith, or Confucianism and the guy that started that, Confucius, or you start throwing out other names of originators of religion like, like Mary Baker Eddy or Charles Taz Russell and a whole host of other names that we could throw out there. The reality of the matter is about that whole list of names is that their graves are still occupied today. When their life came to an end, in one way or another, when their life ended, they were buried. And they're still buried. Their graves are still occupied. Some of these, like Buddhism, I mean, they, they make a pretty big deal about there's one particular shrine that has like temple, I don't know if they call it a temple, but a shrine that's been created that uh, claims that part, one particular joint of Buddha's pinky is there and it's enshrined. And they're really proud of that. But again, it's the whole thing is... Buddha died, and he's still dead, as is the case with all the rest of these. But that can't be said about Jesus. It's a totally different story when it comes to Jesus. There is an empty tomb that at one time had been occupied by Jesus' body, but it wasn't very, occupied very long because he didn't stay dead very long. And there have been all kinds of attempts made to try to explain away this empty tomb because people rightly have drawn the conclusion of realizing that if we could undermine the resurrection of Jesus, then all of Christianity is going to topple. I mean, people like Lee Strobel, you know, he understood that. Josh McDowell, he understood that. And countless other people who set out to disprove the, Christian, the resurrection of Jesus. But time after time, they realized there's too much evidence, and they couldn't disprove it. When I was in college, one of the assigned readings that we had had to do with one of the um, a, a serious attempts that had been made. The book, I think, was written um, back in the 60s or early 70s, and it featured the swoon theory. Now, that particular theory has been around longer than just since 1960 or 1970. But the basic idea behind it is that when Jesus was crucified to the cross, the nails were driven into his hands and feet, and then later the th sword was thrust into his side. He lost enough blood and body fluids that, that uh, he ended up passing out when he was 
on the cross and the guards mistakenly drew the conclusion that he was dead and reported that to Pilate. So Pilate gave permission for Jesus' body to be taken down and that's when he was buried in a tomb. But once Jesus was in the tomb for a couple of days, the coolness of the tomb revived him and he was able to get up and move the stone and he went out and when people spotted him, they mistakenly jumped to the conclusion that he's alive. He overcame death. And so the resurrection became a part of the teaching of his followers. That's the swoon theory summarized in 90 seconds. There, there's obviously some problems with that. How would he have been able to move a stone that weighed 1,500 pounds to 2,000 pounds? You ever stepped on a nail before? Imagine a spike driven through both feet, plus hands that are inflamed as well. How could he have moved the stone? How did he overcome the guards that were stationed there? And these guards, they were stationed with the assignment that uh, you know they, they need to keep watch because if they fail, they forfeit their life as a result. So they would have been motivated. So how did Jesus overcome them? How did Jesus travel seven miles to Emmaus? Because that's how far Emmaus is from Jerusalem. How was he able to walk that distance carrying on a conversation? How was he able to, to give the appearance of victory over death when in reality he would have just looked like death warmed over? I mean, you start thinking all that through and it's just like, oh boy, that's far-fetched. But there are some that really try to reach because they've got to try to explain away the empty tomb. Others take a different angle. They say the Jewish leaders moved Jesus' body for safekeeping. That's why there's an empty tomb. They had removed the body so that Jesus' followers wouldn't be able to get their hands on his body. Uh, okay. But why did they leave the grave clothes behind? What would have been the reason for doing that? And once the followers of Jesus began to, to proclaim near and far the resurrection of Jesus, if they had in their possession the body of Jesus, wouldn't they have tied him up to some kind of a stake in the back of a wagon and paraded him through the streets of Jerusalem declaring, this is the person you said has risen from the dead? But they didn't do any of that for one primary reason. They did not have in their possession the body of Jesus. And so some say, well, the disciples stole the body. They stole it. And then they were the ones that turned around and proclaimed the resurrection. Well, again, why would they leave the grave clothes behind? You would think they had been kind of frantic in the moment that they were doing this. Plus, this is contrary to the frame of mind that they had from everything that we gather is, remember when Jesus was being crucified after he had been arrested, they fled in every direction, right? They were scared, and they were behind locked doors, the Scripture teaches. How did they overcome the soldiers, trained fighting men, in order to get to the body of Jesus? You see, once you start dissecting it and breaking it down, you see that any of these kinds of explanations just don't add up. They don't make sense. As a matter of fact, one of the disciples, just 50 days after the resurrection, we're talking less than two months after Jesus' crucifixion and, and on the third day his resurrection, he said this. In Acts 2, these are Peter's words. 
He says, Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. The fact that the, he, he said this in Jerusalem. And it was right on the edge of Jerusalem where Jesus had been crucified and where he had been buried. And so if Jesus was still in the grave, it would have been easy to have refuted this. But the fact of the matter is no one had an answer for the empty tomb. They couldn't refute it. And that's why Peter's words had so much impact because by that particular point in time, less than two months after all this had happened, word had spread so much that it, it, people were well aware of what it is that had happened. This is at the very heart of the gospel. You look at uh, what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, the entire 15th chapter, which is a pretty long chapter, is talking about the resurrection. And this is the way that Paul starts that chapter. He says this, Now, brothers, I want to clarify for you the gospel I proclaim to you. You received it and have taken your stand on it. You are also saved by it. If you hold to the message I proclaim to you, unless you believe for no reason, for I passed on to you as most important what I also received, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. And then you go into verses 5 and following, and it says, and that he appeared to Cephas, and then to the 12, verse 6. Then he appeared to over 500 at one time. And he starts talking about these resurrection appearances and the fact that there were many people I testified to the fact that they saw Jesus after his death and burial. They saw him alive. You see, the reality of the matter is, when it comes to Christianity, we're not following the teachings of a dead man. You talk about all these other religions, and well, that really is what is happening, is is you're following the teachings of certain individuals that might have been sincere, might have been well-meaning, might have had a following during their life, but yet uh, they died and they stayed dead. But with Jesus, there's a whole different story here. And rightly so, this, this is what so much of Christianity hinges on. Lee Strobel was correct. Josh McDowell was correct that if, if, if you could remove the resurrection of Jesus, then all of a sudden Christianity loses its power because God's stamp of validation has been removed from it all. In fact, Christianity without the resurrection would be like a, 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 um, a 737 plane that uh, is shiny and new and it's got whatever, four, five, six bathrooms in it and padded chairs and, and luggage compartments under the belly and overhead storage and a cockpit. And, and it's got all this stuff, nice and shiny, but no engines. That's what Christianity would be like. Christianity would be uh, um, all sharp and fancy and all of this, but without the resurrection of Christ, Christianity wouldn't be able to take you anywhere. Just like that plane wouldn't be able to take you anywhere if it didn't have any engines. But the fact of the matter is the resurrection of Christ is well established in history. And people that study it, the more they study it, the more they discover that to be true. The fourth thing that sets Christianity apart from all other religions 
is that it relies totally on the grace of God. Here's what represents perhaps the biggest difference, at least according to C.S. Lewis. You know, he says that this is the, the biggest difference, and it certainly is a biggie. Grace. Every other religion offers some sort of a spiritual merit system. That if you do this, this, and this, then you'll earn some points. Then you'll be in better favor, and you'll be more likely to achieve you know, whatever the goal is, heaven, paradise, nirvana, or whatever the case might be, that, that, if, that if you will do these things, then um, when those are credited to your account, then you will be able to be rewarded with whatever it is that they believe in their religion. The problem with that is you, you never ever know if you've done enough. I mean, you say all these prayers. You, if you're a Jehovah Witness, you knock on all these doors and they need to have a certain quota of doors and a certain amount of literature they need to distribute, but they never know. Have they done enough literature? Have they knocked on enough doors? So, so there's never really assurance of salvation, you know, or their particular belief or brand of salvation because they never know if they've earned it yet. Christianity is different. Christianity, from the very beginning, it's right up front in saying that there is zero possibility of you earning salvation. Zero possibility. You will never be able to earn your salvation. And the Bible comes out very clear about that. That you cannot be good enough. You cannot toe the line well enough. You cannot achieve uh, enough good deeds or say enough prayers or give enough or whatever the case might be in order to get saved. As a matter of fact, this is what the Mosaic Law was all about. You know, and I'm talking about the Ten Commandments along with all those other commands that went with it at Mount Sinai. It was not only to open people's eyes to uh, the fact that they've missed the mark and they've sinned, but it was also to send a loud and clear message that you cannot be good enough because you fall short. And setting aside all the other commands, if you just take the Ten Commandments, there's not a one of us in this room that can say, hey, I've hit a home run on every one of those every single time in my life. We haven't done it. And that was the purpose of opening our eyes to that realization. And that's why in the book of Galatians, it talks about God's law, talking about the Ten Commandments and all those other commands. And it's saying that all of that represented um, itself as being a tutor to lead us to Christ. To help us to realize we need a Savior. We can't do this on our own. And in the next message in this series, that's what we're going to break down in more detail. But for now, let me say, say this. All other religions focus on what you must do. Christianity, the focus is on what has been done for you. All other religions, it's what you must do. Christianity. The focus is on what Jesus has done for you. And that's why you have passages like Ephesians 2 that says, For you are saved by grace through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is God's gift, not from works, so that no one can boast. There's not a one of us in this room that can pat ourselves on the back and say, Hey, good going. I achieved it. Because I've fallen short. And you've fallen short. And that's the simple definition of sin. Is to miss the mark. We have all missed the mark. But. Due to his grace. He's got a special gift for us. The gift of salvation. One of the things that comes through loud and clear. 
in the Bible is that you cannot earn your way to heaven. But the irony is that that also is part of why you can have assurance of salvation. Because you don't have to rely upon personal performance. It's because of what Jesus did on your behalf. That's why you can have confidence in salvation. He's already accomplished it. And so we can have the assurance of knowing that if this happens to be the week that our heart stops beating and we die, that we know where we're going to be. As believers, we're going to be in the presence of our Lord. Our ushers are going to be getting up at this time and preparing for our time of communion. And uh, while they're preparing, I, I want to say something that, you know, it's, I say this knowing full well, I might get a little kickback on this. But uh, um, I'm going to say it because I believe it to be true. The Bible does not claim that Christianity is the best way to God. The Bible doesn't make that claim. That Christianity is the best way to God. Rather, instead, the claim the Bible makes is that it's the only way to God. And in our pluralistic world today, and the understandings that are floating around about tolerance and all of this kind of stuff, you know, that really um, is bothersome for people. They don't think that's right. But the reality of the matter is we're not the ones making the rules on this, right? This is what the Bible teaches. It's not the best way out of a bunch of ways. It's the only way. To God. You know, it can look pretty confusing when you look at all the different religions out there and all the different choices, and there's just so many of them. But when you break it down in the way that we broke it down today, you begin to see more clearly why Christianity stands apart from all the rest. And there's going to be even more clarity when we focus the spotlight even closer on Jesus in our next message. Let's pray. Father, thank you for today, for the opportunity for us to be able to talk about a matter of great importance. And we're thankful for your word and how it teaches us. Um, there are so many notions that are floating around, various belief systems that are out there, and some of them... Um, you know, involve some very sincere people and, and uh, it can be confusing and it's fairly easy to be misled. And I'm thankful, Lord, for your word and how your word lays it out. If we'll just take the time to read and to understand the message that you've given us. Thank you for Jesus. For his willingness to come into the world and to do for us what uh, we were incapable of doing for ourselves. And here in a moment, while the trays are passed, when we, we take the bread and we eat it in the cup and we drink it, we celebrate what Jesus did on our behalf. That incredible sacrifice that he made, the sinless life that he had lived which qualified him to make that sacrifice to make it possible for us to be forgiven. Lord, that's what we celebrate is we celebrate the forgiveness that can only be found in Jesus. Thank you for loving us so much that you gave us something that not a one of us in here deserved. In Christ's name I pray, amen.